Welcome to Football Full Circle right here on the Sports Grid Radio and Television Network. Joe Lisi and Ritz Sermonello kicking around college football. We talked about the Big Ten in hour number one. Going to turn our attention to the SEC in hour number two. But breaking news came last month with Arch Manning committing to the University of Texas. Quinn Ewers is a five-star recruit. Steve Sarkeesian lured Arch Manning to, to commit to Texas, and all eyes are on the Texas Longhorns, not just this season, but when they enter the SEC in 2025, Rich. I mean, when we talked about it in terms of the recruiting aspect, Texas now has the top three overall best quarterback recruits in the history of of college football. And what I mean by that is 247 puts out a perfect rating. Uh, uh, you look at um, right now in terms of Vince Young, two, 2006, had a perfect rating, Quinn Ewers, and now Arch Manning. So Steve Sarkeesian getting it done in terms of the recruiting aspect. Can he get it done in terms of bringing Longhorns a Big 12 title? Uh, this soon we'll see. I'm a little bit dubious because of that defense, but he, here's the thing about, um, Arch Manning who will come in in 2023. And I, I'm assuming it's going to create just an epic battle with Quinn yours. I think Hudson card, who's also in the mix will probably be on a different campus at that point. He'll, he'll already have transferred, but the thing about Arch Manning is terrific quarterback. You know, we all know about the potential. I think he'll be as good as advertised, uh, possibly early in his career. But what this does to, to get this kind of attention, to beat out the Georgias and the Alabamas and anybody else who was, uh, who was after the five-star quarterback, it's going to make it that much easier to get more of these four- and five-star kids. I think it opens the eyes of wide receivers around the country, young superstar wide receivers, to say, if they can get an Arch Manning, if this is where Sark is taking Texas as they head into the SEC in a couple of years, maybe I need to get on board. And, and, and some of that cachet with Texas was lost and has been lost for well over a decade because the program hasn't been where they traditionally were, hasn't been uh, since those Vince Young days. So now it brings a lot of much needed attention. It's going to make it easier to get recruits. Quickly, in terms of this year, Joe, the offense is going to be phenomenal. I, I, I expect big things from uh, Quinn Yours, and, and if he's not able to do it, Hudson Card is a capable quarterback who was the starter in week one last year. But with Bijan Robinson in the backfield, Xavier Worthy, Isaiah Nayor uh, out of Wyoming, Jaleel Billingsley, the tight end from Alabama, they're going to rock offensively. I just worry about that defense, you know, especially in a league now. That has Dave Aranda and Baylor. I, I think Texas is going to run right into a brick wall with the Baylor Bears when they face off this year. Oh, I agree. And that's been the concern for Texas, not just last year, but in the days of Tom Herman, right? He did take the team in terms of his last uh, year there to a 7-3 and three overall record, won four straight bowl games, but couldn't get over the hump in terms of bringing a Big 12 championship to the boosters in Austin. And when you look at Steve Sarkeesian, and I agree with you, that offense is going to be explosive. They are going to look to outscore teams early and often, but the front seven allowed about 195 rushing yards to opposing offenses. If they play that way and don't get it up until, like, let's say, the, the ranked 50th in the country, they're going to be in trouble, not just in the Big 12, but when they square off against the Alabama Crimson Tide on September 10th, as we welcome in our radio audience, Joe Lisi and Rich Sermonello breaking down the Big 12 odds and talking about Steve Sarkeesian getting top five uh, commit quarterback Arch Manning committing to the Texas Longhorns for 2023. What does that mean for the Longhorns, not just this season, but in terms of the big picture? Let me ask you this, Rich. If they go under 500, or let's say they go six and six, is that acceptable? And more importantly, you think Steve Sarkeesian is allowed to keep his job to 2025 until see the, until this thing maybe pans out? Because I don't think there's a lot of margin of error. They are behind the curve in some of the programs like Oklahoma and Oklahoma State and Baylor, respectively. They need to get it done sooner rather than later. They can't afford until they get into the SEC to make a change. Yeah, well, listen, attention is a double-edged sword. It, it, it's great to get the attention that comes with, you know, attracting a Quinn Ewers uh, elite 
prospect. I and I and I think I've watched him on tape. I think he's uh, I think he's a super talented, tremendous arm talent. We'll see what happens when he gets into live game action. But you get the attention of a Quinn Ewers, you get the attention of an Arch Manning. The program has the attention of heading heading off to the SEC. You now have to deliver in terms of you know forget hot seat or anything like that. I, I think. You know, Arch Manning partially chose Texas, and maybe largely chose Texas because of the relationship with Steve Sarkeesian. I don't think the administration is going to mess with that right now. So Sark is safe, but I, I think in this Big 12, which is not that deep uh, with the talent that he has, I, I think he's got to really be sniffing around a 9 or 10 win season. And, and why not win a Big 12? It's there for the taking, especially as Oklahoma breaks in a new coach. It is Dylan Gabriel, the new quarterback for the Oklahoma Sooners. Adrian Martinez with Kansas State and Chris Kleiman. They're an 18-to-1 shot. I still like Joey McGuire and Donovan Smith and Sir Roderick Thompson at 50-to-1. When we come back, SEC Talk, Joe Lisi and Rich Sermonello right here on The Grid. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Gam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. Pro Football Doc has found its new home right here with Sports Injury Central. And with that comes our expansion into other sports. Sports Injury Central will give you nonstop exclusive injury analysis from experienced team doctors from all three major sports. Doctors with resumes that include teams like the Chicago Bulls, the Texas Rangers, and the LA Chargers. So gain a fantasy DFS and betting edge right now for free at SICscore.com. The morning after. Now Joey Chestnut's like a minus 5,000 favorite against the rest of the field to defend that mustard belt. But the over under for hot dogs and buns consumed in that 10 minute competition span is 74 and a half. Joey Chestnut over this number by a dog and a half last year, 76. He just keeps setting records. He'll do so again on the corner of Surf and Stillwell on Monday morning over 74 and a half. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. Because what's clearly clearly decipher what happened here kevin durant watched what you did to kyrie irving and said yeah i'm gone i'm obviously not doing this why did kyrie opt in because kevin durant told him he was leaving so kyrie said yeah i'm gonna get the 36 million from you guys i don't need to go take six million from the lakers i'm gonna end up there anyway because KD's gonna request out and what are you gonna do leave me here you don't even like me only on sports grid the Pat McAfee Show. Well, let's just make this clear. And I'm not OBJ's agent, right? But if I were, and if I were OBJ, and teams are trying to figure out what's happening with my ACL, what I'm doing, all I'm doing is taking out the tape of the first half of the Super Bowl, playing that, and then hanging up. Is that not worth, I'm asking you, is that not worth 10 million plus just that? If, you, if you're in the postseason, what is that worth to you all? The Sports Grid Network.
Last year, the Georgia Bulldogs won their first national championship in 41 years. Uh, they defeated the Alabama Crimson Tide and Heisman Trophy winner Bryce Young in the national championship game. The SEC had two teams within the college football playoff best conference over the last decade in terms of the dominance by Nick Saban and the conference as a whole. We'll turn our attention to start, Rich, in the SEC East. The attrition by Kirby Smart and the Georgia Bulldogs is evident. They had 15 players move on to the NFL, but Stetson Bennett returns. Georgia right now, minus 550 on the FanDuel Sportsbook to win the conference even though the attrition on the defensive side of the ball, make no mistake about it, Georgia is loaded, and they're going to be the team to beat in 2022. Yeah, I listen, if you're looking for value uh, out of the SEC, it's always difficult, especially these days. SEC East, um, I don't see a ton of value. There are teams that I like. I think Tennessee and Josh Heupel. Uh, Josh Heupel with his quarterback, Hendon Hooker, receiver Cedric Tillman. I think they will be a lot of fun to watch. They'll score a lot of points. Uh, Music City Bowl loss to Purdue is sort of a, a good example of what their games will look like this year. So a lot of fun happening in Knoxville. But, you know, the Georgia is at a point right now where they did lose a ton of players to the NFL. Anybody who watched the NFL draft knows just how uh, – you know, just how good that program is, but they're going to simply reload. It's it's next man in. Uh, you've got your quarterback back in Stetson Bennett. Uh, you're going to have a new set of running backs. Uh, you know, uh, they're not going to have a problem scoring points. They're not going to have a problem stopping teams. Uh, and although Kentucky and Mark Stoops is doing a good job, and again, I mentioned Josh Heupel. I love what Shane Beamer is doing at South Carolina at 40 to 1, but it would be a big surprise right now if anybody unseats Georgia. I think they're as good as advertised. If there's going to be some value, maybe, could be out of the West. I just don't see it in the East this year. No, I'm with you. I think the biggest thing for Georgia is can they maintain the momentum, right? The, the biggest thing about Alabama – and when Nick Saban has been able to do is he's built a program, right? Players move on to the NFL, but it hasn't been just players. It's losing coordinators and to maintain that momentum each and every year where they're like a fine-tuned machine. They understand the process. They understand what they have to do to win football games, the winning mentality. That's what I think Georgia and Kirby Smart need to really attain right can they sustain the type of hits that they have taken not just with the players but now they lose Dan Lanning their defensive coordinator that has become the offensive and new head coach of Oregon how do they sustain that type of hit because Nick Saban loses a coordinator or two each and every year and guess what they're they're always competing for a college football playoff appearance there's no doubt that Georgia is the best team in the east but are they still built to win or potentially crack the college football playoff this year. Yeah, hey, Joe, you bring up a really important point. Uh, the difference between being a great team, a great year, and a dynasty is exactly what you touched on. Nick Saban has been able to build this dynastic run, uh, not just out of recruiting and coaching up talent, but keeping his kids hungry. Uh, and finding those assistant coaches when you lose an assistant to a head coaching position or another school or the NFL, he does as good a job as anyone, better than anyone, at inserting new talent in terms of coaching and new talent in terms of player personnel. And that hunger all begins in the offseason in Tuscaloosa. Nobody is better at keeping his kids hungry. I've said it for years that to me has been the most impressive thing about Nick Saban. It's not just the wins, it's not just the titles, but the fact that you can keep young men between the, the ages of 19 and 22, 23 hungry, despite the fact that they've won titles already, is a remarkable feat. And now that's what Kirby Smart is, is looking at. The talent is there. He's recruited extremely well. You're going to hear new names step up, like on defense, now that there's been that attrition, Jalen Carter up front, Nolan Smith off the edge, Kelly Ringo uh, in the defensive backfield. Tyke Smith, that's a name I want to quickly point out. Out of the secondary, Tyke Smith was a big pickup out of West Virginia last year, but he was injured, didn't get a chance to play during the championship season. So 
Tyke Smith will be someone who uses this year as a catapult to the NFL. Georgia is where they need to be, but to your point, can they maintain that hunger? Can they stay on top and win uh, not an SEC title? Remember, they weren't SEC champs last year. Can they actually win an SEC title this year? Yeah, great point. And they opened week one against Oregon and Bo Nix, right? That's the the main cause of concern. They're going up against their former defensive coordinator. Now the talent might not be as rich as it was last year with Kayvon Thibodeau moving on to the NFL, Travis Dye moving on to USC. But Dan Lanning, if anybody understands the talent and how it responds in terms of game situations, it would have to be their star defensive coordinator. And to give them maybe 17 or 17 and a half points in a week one matchup might be appealing, especially from the sports gambling perspective. We'll break that, that, that game down a little bit later. But here's the other factor as well. If we're looking at teams, Rich, right? Not just in the East, but to potentially, let's say, upseat uh, Georgia and Alabama. I think you could only look to the West. I mean, I'm not really sold on the East as a whole. I think there are a lot of teams that are good. They're not elite. I think Georgia's head and shoulders above the rest. I think the West does have potentially some teams that are on the cusp of maybe turning the corner to challenge Alabama. Let's not forget that when you look at Alabama last year, They did win the SEC championship, but they did play down to the level of competition in a number of different ballgames, right? They were double-digit favorites, 14, 15 points on the road in Gainesville, struggled to win that ballgame by two. They were 20-and-a-half-point dogs against Arkansas, won by seven. They were 19-and-a-half-point favorites, excuse me, against Auburn, won by two. There were a number of different games, 29-point favorites against LSU. They had a hold on in terms of a goal line stand in that ballgame. So the West played Alabama a lot tougher than the East did last year, and I think that's where maybe you look in terms of value from the SEC in 2022. Completely agree. I, I Despite the fact that Alabama is in the West and Texas A&M is going to be very good out of the West, I, I think if you're looking for value, if you want to avoid the chalk, I think it is in the West, which is not something we've said much over the years. Typically, the East was the weaker division, and if you wanted value, you'd stayed in the SEC East. I don't think that's the case right now because there are some quality teams out West. We're looking at, you know, uh, Ole Miss, I think, could start the season 7-0. and I think that schedule sets up really well. Uh, interesting offseason for Lane Kiffin. Uh, he was, as you know, described himself as the portal king, and I think he earned it this year. Did a phenomenal job in the transfer portal. Uh, really accumulated a lot of talent from various schools around the country. So Ole Miss is a team to be watched. And and LSU, we've talked a lot this offseason about LSU. Brian Kelly's debut, a lot of uncertainty, but also did a phenomenal job in the transfer portal. It's going to have to get that chemistry started right out of the gate against Florida State. But those two teams, Ole Miss and LSU, 16-1, to 40-1 for LSU. A lot of talent there. If you want some value, I think those are two places to start. And you mentioned Ole Miss. They get the benefit of USC transfer quarterback Jackson Dart. He comes over to take the reins over for Matt Corral. And you talk about LSU experience at the quarterback position with senior Miles Brennan returning. They also get Jaden Daniels that transfers over from Arizona State. So there's experience at the quarterback position for both of those teams heading into this season, that could always sustain in terms of offensive productivity. And let's not forget, when you look at LSU, potentially two of the best wide receivers within the conference in Kayshawn Booty and Jare Jenkins. When we come back, more SEC talk. Joe Lisi and Ritz Sermonello right here on The Grid. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play less games. The morning after. 
we saw movement in the marketplace like fantasy Magic. sports the today Cavaliers are a little thin as well news wire minus 160 favorite on the money line today for arizona pharrell and coast to DBG, coast that's where they win cups they win stanley cups over there give me the game Packers. time decision kind of bizarre when you consider it like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game, live, all like access. Mandy. I like Mandy against Bam. I think Mandy can win the game, take a four and a half. In game, oh, live, man. prime oh, time. Is the PGA champion. In yes. game, live, overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. Fantasy Sports Today. And so it's hard to imagine someone like Trevor Story not just pelting the wall over and over and over again. And in April, there was a long stretch there where it was like, mm, maybe the most obvious thing isn't gonna happen. But then it did start happening. You know, luck, good luck caught up to him. And in May and June, he started to hit the ball better. Only on Sports Grid, the early line. But if, when I would ask who are the worst ran organizations in the NBA, right? People would. Sacramento Kings probably would enter the conversation. Charlotte Hornets might enter the conversation. The Knicks, maybe the Rockets, depends who you are. What the Brooklyn Nets have put forward is one of the most embarrassing displays from a front office you will ever see. And yet somehow people are out there championing this front office. We are taking control back. Only on Sports Grid. Sports professor Rick Haro, inside the $1.3 trillion business of sports. We your sports news minute. Well, mixed signals out of Virginia. April, under $400 million bet for the first time since it started years ago or months ago, let's say, with the 12 book operators. But let's not hold a bake sale for the state of Virginia. It was still up 69% year over year compared to the last April measurement. And April seems to be a clean out month. The final four clearly happens. No Virginia team in it. But then basketball kind of segues into the pros, masters big, but not really bet as a big number. And as everybody suggests in Virginia and elsewhere, you can't wait until maybe the NBA playoffs, but certainly baseball heating up, and obviously more important than any of that, college and pro football, that continues to drive the day in Virginia and around. Back on Football Full Circle, Joe Lisi, Ritz, Sermonello breaking down the SEC East uh, right now. We talked about Georgia. We talked about potentially the teams that can challenge the Bulldogs. Week one is just about 60 days away, and jo Georgia does open against top-ranked Oregon and their former defensive coordinator, Dan Lanning. This get line opened up originally on FanDuel as Georgia <laughs> A 15 and a half point favorite. It immediately, Rich, got bet up to about 17. It's about 17 and a half now in some books in the state of New Jersey. That's two touchdowns and a field goal to start a week one matchup against a team that played in the Pac 12 championship against the Utah Utes. I'd be inclined early to take Oregon in this matchup. We saw this play out a couple of years ago with Sam Pittman becoming the head coach of Arkansas, right? He was the offensive line coach for Kirby Smart, understood the talent. Arkansas was a great bet in the first half of that matchup. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Georgia Bulldogs. I believe they trailed 12-7 to in the first half. Maybe you look to Oregon, not just plus the 17 and a half, but maybe plus points in terms of the first half value against the defending national champions. Yeah, it's an interesting matchup because of the things you touched on. The fact that it is Dan Lanning, former uh, Georgia defensive coordinator, facing his old team. The fact that uh, Bo Nix will be the Oregon quarterback. Fascinating. Obviously knows the SEC from his Auburn days. Uh, now has a new lease on life to try to resurrect his career. Again, uh, use this final season as an opportunity to attract NFL scouts. My biggest concern is the coaching side of things. Uh, Dan Lanning 
He's never been a head coach before, obviously knows Athens very well, but doesn't uh, know the rigors of a head coaching position. If this was Mario Cristobal, I think that number would look a lot more appealing. We talked in the first hour about you know, what Cristobal and, and Oregon was able to do in Columbus last year, uh, upsetting Ohio State, shocking Ohio State. Not sure if I see that type of a situation. I, I, I think Georgia flies all over the field. Uh, Oregon has a well-built team. I think this could be a, a solid season for Lanning. I think it could even be potentially a Pac-12 title season for Lanning. Uh Love the linebackers, Justin Flo, Noah Sewell, Byron Cardwell is a sleeper at running back, but I just don't see them scoring many points here. This looks to me, uh, you know, like a 34 to 10 type opener. Uh, I, I would be inclined to lay the points in, uh, in Athens in week one, Joe. Now it's played on a neutral field, but the game is played in the Mercedes. Thank Benz you for that zone. correction. Basically, appreciate uh, that. Right, right. Uh, a, a home game for Georgia, basically, right. In terms of that's where they play the SEC championship. So we'll see how that plays out. But I agree with you. I think the biggest question mark for Oregon in terms of an offensive perspective is what do you get out of Bo Nix, an inconsistent quarterback during his tenure on the Plains in Auburn, didn't step up in big ball games, made some poor decisions, not an elite passer either, right? If you're going to challenge Georgia, you're going to have to be able to stretch them over the top, and that's really not the strength of Bo Nix in terms of his game. And they lose some playmakers on the offensive side of the ball, so we have to see how that affects the Oregon offense in year number one with the new head coach. I'm curious to see what they put on as a total for this because – is it in the 60s? We know about the dominance of Kirby Smart's defense last year. Teams really struggled to put up points in a majority of their ball games. It wasn't until they went to the SEC championship and Jamison Williams and Bryce Young attacked that secondary early and often over 400 yards to really expose the Georgia defense. But, you know, can Oregon do that early on? If they can, maybe they can keep it within the number. We'll see how that game plays out. The other game in the West, Rich, is Florida and Utah. Now, this game is played in Gainesville, and we've seen some early movement in terms of uh, the gamblers back in Utah in this matchup. Florida opened up as a two-point favorite with their first-year head coach, Billy Napier, the former Louisiana Lafayette head coach, the former coordinator to Nick Saban a few years ago in Alabama. Now the line is flipped. Utah is a two-point road favorite in Gainesville. This is not going to be an easy matchup for Billy Napier in year number one, and more importantly, as quarterback Anthony Richardson. You look at Utah last year, they went toe-to-toe with Ryan Day in Ohio State, losing the Rose Bowl 48-45. to There's no margin of error for Utah if they're going to want to crack the college football playoff. They're going to need to win this ball game with style points. I like the Utes early on in this ball game. Yeah, as do I, Joe. It's interesting that we had the uh, the line flashed up there. Uh, Gators, yeah, there we go. Gators getting to Utah, the slight favorite. I, I would say to everyone thinking about this opener, and it's got so many great storylines, uh, Billy Napier and, and Anthony Richardson being two of them. Watch the line movement in this game because if – Money goes on Florida, and Utah becomes the dog in this game. I want to throw a number out to you. The last 14 times that Utah was a road dog, they have covered 13 of those games. So Utah under Kyle Whittingham as a road dog uh, has been almost perfect over the last 14 times, 13-1. and one. Now, they're currently... Uh, the favorite, if they become a, a dog, and I wouldn't be surprised if some late money comes in on Florida since this game is being played in the swamp, uh, since there are so many expectations for Anthony Richardson. He flashed last year, Joe, uh, when he was able to get on the field as the backup, uh, as the uh, change of pace to Emory Jones. He was fantastic, uh, especially running the ball. So Anthony Richardson that era begins, but Utah so good under Kyle Whittingham as one of the better backfields in the country. Cam Rising under center, Tavion Thomas, the former Cincinnati running back. Both of those guys uh, were first team all Pac-12 last year. So big game for Utah. If Utah has any dreams of possibly cracking uh, the college football playoff, 
uh, winning on the road uh, in SEC country would be a great place to start. Oh, that would be a huge win. Let, let me just say this. It would be a huge win for Kyle Winningham and Cam Rising if they were to pull this ball game out, especially if they do it in dominating fashion. They win this ball game by double digits. They're definitely going to catapult in terms of potentially being a top 10 team. Let's not forget, as a six and a half point underdog in the Rose Bowl, they went toe to toe with C.J. Stroud. I mean, Ohio State needed all 500 yards of C.J. Stroud in that ball game to get the win. They were on the cusp of getting the cover, opted not to kick the field goal in that ball game, Rich. But on the flip side for Florida, you know, Billy Napier right now is, in, in my opinion, a, a rebuild from where Dan Mullen was. Love Anthony Richardson, love his athleticism, but really didn't coach up in terms of Dan Mullen, right? Didn't coach up the quarterbacks the way we would have hoped to, that he would have done, right? Didn't, didn't really cultivate Emory Jones, didn't coach up Anthony Richardson to where we saw Dak Prescott in terms of his days in Starkville. So that's still a question mark entering the season for Florida. And when you see a win total for Florida right now at seven, I don't know if they get there in year number one. I think Napier needs to weed out the players that fit his scheme, both offensively and defensively, that could take a couple of years to get acclimated into. And right now, I think it'll be more of a two- or three-year rebuild. I think they lose this ballgame, but I think right now, I think put them right behind of Tennessee and Kentucky in terms of the SEC East in terms of standings right now in year number one under Billy Napier. Yeah, whenever you're evaluating a first-year coach, obviously you want to know who that coach is and what his track record is. Billy Napier uh, did a tremendous job in Lafayette uh, with the Raging Cajuns. Uh, you mentioned his time with Nick Saban, so he has the pedigree. He has the background. We'll see if he can pull it off uh, as a big-time head coach, Power 5 head coach for the first time in his career. But when you're evaluating year one in terms of futures markets or uh, – over the number, under the number uh, for season win total, you want to know what that coach inherited. And, and unfortunately for Billy Napier, Dan Mullen did not do a great job of recruiting. Should have been able to. You're the Florida Gators. You're in the Sunshine State. You're surrounded by so much talent. You have the, the tradition and the history. But recruiting was not a major priority for Dan Mullen. He was able to get away with it for the first couple of years, but then it started to catch up to him. Couldn't coach up those players the way he did in Starkville, those two- and three-star players. And now Billy Napier and that staff inherits a roster that's not quite as talented as we're used to in Florida. So I agree with you, Joe. I think this is a transition year. Anthony Richards gonna, Richardson's going to be exciting. I think he's going to make a lot of big plays. But up and down that roster, offensive line, defensive line. I think there's some work to be done. Would not surprise me if this was a six and six year. Better days ahead, but I don't think we see that until 2023 in the swamp. You know what's interesting in terms of the quarterback position, Rich, is that Georgia and Florida, okay, with Stetson Bennett and Anthony Richardson might be behind both Hendon Hooker Will Levis, in terms of the, the quarterback experience and productivity in, tw in terms of 2022. Hendon Hooker and Will Levis might have more upside than both Anthony Richardson and Stetson Bennett, respectively. I'm disappointed, Joe, that you did not mention Spencer Rattler in that discussion as well, no, because I, he's, I, I left he's also you. in the I SEC left East. You. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I will see what he could do with Shane Beamer, I mean, in year number two. It's it, definitely an upgrade from where they were last year. We'll see if Shane Beamer could get this team back to a bowl game, got a bowl victory over their arch rival, the North Carolina Tar Heels, right now 40-1 to one to win the SEC East. When we come back, we'll wrap it up with the SEC West. Joe Lisi and Ritz Sermonello right here on The Grid. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. 
Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or tune in, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. Pre-game, pre-game. Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds. All the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Liu, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions. Only on Sports Grid. The early line. Kevin Durant is right now the sixth best player in the NBA. For a lot of people, a top five player in the sport. For anybody, clearly a top ten player in the NBA. An all-time great with four full years on his contract. When this is wrapped up, this very well could be the biggest trade in the history of the NBA. That is very, like, right, Walter Payton, if I'm not wrong, Don, the biggest trade maybe in, in NFL history. Only on Sports Grid. Pro Football Doc has found its new home right here with Sports Injury Central. And with that comes our expansion into other sports. Sports Injury Central will give you nonstop exclusive injury analysis from experienced team doctors from all three major sports. Doctors with resumes that include teams like the Chicago Bulls, the Texas Rangers, and the LA Chargers. So gain a fantasy DFS and betting edge right now for free at SICscore.com. The morning after. From that Big Ten perspective, who are some schools you expect that conference to target to add as additional members? Well, it's really Notre Dame or bust at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Notre Dame would be the golden child in terms of that type of scenario because you look at the regular season matchups. USC plays Notre Dame each and every year. Notre Dame has has a history with Michigan and Michigan State, respectively. And why not, you know, have Notre Dame play Ohio State every year? The Sports Grid Network. out the second hour of the show joe lisi ritz sermonello breaking down the sec we talked about georgia and their dominance which team potentially can knock off the bulldogs in 2022 we'll turn our attention to the quarterback battles in the sec west two teams in particular auburn and lsu will have quarterback battles zach calzada and tj finley battling it out in auburn for brian harson in year number two Brian Kelly gets the benefit of Jaden Daniels battling Miles Brennan. Which team will name their starter? I'm sure both teams will let it go until late August, until about two weeks before the kickoff of, of the season. Right now, if I had a bet, I would take T.J. Finley, Rich, over Zach Calzada. I know Finley didn't step up last year taking over for Bo Nix, but he's still an athletic quarterback. I like his arm. I like his athleticism. I know Calzada was able to get the victory over Alabama as an 18-and-a-half point uh, underdog in College Station, but in a handful of games last year, in particular against Arkansas as a a four-and-a-half point favorite, he didn't get it done, and the inconsistency resembles his predecessor in Bo Nix. Uh, Joe, I'm going to go way off script here and, and say that the best quarterback this year on the Plains will be neither of those two. I actually think wow. it's going to be Robbie Ashford. Yeah, I, I, Robbie Ashford is a recruit um, a transfer, I should say, not a recruit, but a transfer out of Oregon. And 
you know, Auburn this year to have success, I don't expect a lot from the passing game. And, and Calzada and Finley are, are both uh, inconsistent. Robbie Ashford brings uh, the most explosiveness with his feet. And, and I think Brian Harson with this, uh, this really pivotal year, year two for him at Auburn, He's going to lean heavily on Tank Bigsby, the running back. And I think to have an athletic quarterback behind center like a Robbie Ashford. Now, he may not start the season at the starter, but if the offense struggles in the early going, would not be surprised to see Brian Harson to go with a more athletic option under center. Big picture, though, uh, there are a lot of problems at Auburn, and they don't have the, uh, the talent to stack up in the SEC West. Earlier, we talked about there being – value in the West. That could come from LSU. It could come from Ole Miss. A&M and Alabama are as talented as anybody in the country. Mississippi State with Will Rogers back at uh, uh, for Mike Leach. There's a lot of talent in that division. Sam Pittman in Arkansas continues to do a good job. The team that could be left out of that mix and could potentially finish in last in the division is Auburn. And I think if that happens with the offseason – of turbulence that Brian Harson faced, I think he could be out of a job uh, after just two seasons, which doesn't happen often, but could happen this year. Could happen September 18th or 19th when James Franklin and Penn State go on the road. Already there are one point favorite against the Auburn Tigers. You re mentioned and you mentioned that ball game last year, Rich, right? They were six, six and a half point underdogs. They battled Penn State every step of the way and lost that matchup by eight points. So you, when you look at it as a whole, there were a number of different letdowns for the Auburn Tigers last year. They had a big lead in the first half at home late in the season against Mississippi State. One of the worst comebacks, biggest comebacks in terms of not just SEC football, but in all of FBS, one of the worst defeats in Auburn Tiger history happened late in the season. You cannot allow that to happen if you're Brian Harson. And then we see Derek Mason move on, just did not like what he saw. He moves on to Oklahoma State to be the new defensive coordinator taking over for Jim Knowles. We see that they get the benefit of Zach Calzada, but Bo Nix, your former quarterback, transfers out. So if they lose that matchup to James Franklin and Penn State, and let's say they start, I don't know, two and two, or let's say two and three in the first month of the season, is there the potential for Brian Harson to be fired midseason, knowing how the boosters are on the planes? Well, not just the boosters, Joe, but you're seeing more in-season firings at big programs. Uh, you know, Clay Helton last year at USC. The reason why is uh, these search committees, these administrations need as much time as possible. Uh, they need a runway. They need time to, uh, to find that right candidate, especially at a major program like an SEC school. Uh, they need time to, uh, to to basically get all of their ducks in a row and prepare for the next head coach. So uh, if if they were thinking it's the, the end of the line for Brian Harson, I don't think they're going to wait till the end of November. I don't think they wait till the Iron Bowl. They would pull the plug uh, as early as possible to get a head start to beat other programs for the top candidates. And, you know, as we look at the SEC West, look at the personalities and the success rates. Nick Saban. Jimbo Fisher, Lane Kiffin, Mike Leach, um, Brian Kelly now, and Brian Harson, which was a curious hire from the start. You know, he comes from uh, the Mountain West and, and Boise State and quite frankly did not do a great job at Boise State. He didn't maintain the same level of excellence that we had seen, you know, back in the Chris Peterson days. Uh, he kind of went sideways. So it was a very curious hire. And if you're going to compete in the SEC West, the ultra competitive SEC West, you got to be a great head coach. And I'm just not convinced Brian Harson is that guy. And I'm not convinced that he has the talent to prove otherwise this season. So if it's a six and six kind of a year, uh, on the Plains, again, I, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if Auburn's looking to turn the page and find a mega coach to compete with the ones I just mentioned. Yeah, they're going to have to, right? If they limp to a 6-6 six and six overall record, I agree with that. I think Harson's gone. Didn't have an identity 
last year. And more importantly, you lost the identity in terms of what you mentioned at Boise State. They slowly regressed year after year, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Doesn't have elite quarterbacks entering this year. Now, maybe he catches lightning in a bottle uh, in terms of the Oregon transfer and can stretch defenses over the top. Uh, vertically, but not very strong wide receivers. They're going to have to rely on the offensive line and the front seven from a defensive perspective with a new defensive coordinator this coming season. That's why they're 40-1 to one to win the SEC West, so we'll see how it plays out. But the other team that we talked about in terms of a quarterback battle, Miles Brennan and Jaden Daniels for LSU, is a pretty good recipe for Brian Kelly to have in year number one. Miles da- uh, Brennan was... Uh, opted out and transferred out of the program. He lured him back when he became the head coach. He's a strong on kid. Went toe-to-toe with K.J. Costello a couple of years ago in terms of the year after the national championship with Joe Burrow. I mean, this offense is really loaded. They get the benefit of Penn State running back Noah Kane in terms of the running back position with John Emery. The foundation is there. I think people forget that, you know, LSU won a national championship a couple of years ago, 15-0. and 0. They were able to recruit top 10 talent with the likes of Alabama. Now, even though they lost some players in terms of the transfer portal, the foundation is there with the right coaching to immediately become – a 9-3 and three football team. And when you look at their win total on FanDuel right now, it's 6.5 and, and minus 110 either way. I'm willing to take that bet in year number one because I believe in Brian Kelly. I believe in the foundation of the skill talent in Baton Rouge. And more importantly, I think it's a winnable conference. When you look at Alabama, outside of Alabama, which is the second-best team? We think it's Texas A&M and, uh, and, and Jimbo Fisher – But last year, they lost games that they shouldn't have as well. They lost to Arkansas. They lost to Mississippi State uh, as a a nine-and-a-half-point home favorite. You cannot allow that to happen each and every week in the SEC. And in year number one, in my opinion, Rich, I think Brian Kelly's playing with house money. Completely agree. I, I, you know, we're looking at the graphic here at 40-1. to You know, I wouldn't mess with anybody other than Alabama, and if, and if I was, maybe Texas A&M, but I, but I think Alabama wins the West. I, I think the smarter money is what you touched on, Joe, which is that six and a half. Now, I, I know the schedule's tough. Anytime you play in that half of the uh, SEC, regardless of what your non-conference schedule is, it's going to be a tough slate, and they do open the season against Florida State, so it's not like it's, a, it's an FCS opponent. So the schedule's tough. And I get that, but you have a veteran like Brian Kelly, albeit in a in a new uh, team for the first time in over a decade. But everywhere he's been, he's been successful. Lower levels, Cincinnati, Notre Dame for over a decade. He's a veteran coach. He's assembled a veteran staff. And in terms of the talent, you know, look at the quarterbacks that you mentioned. Miles Brennan, I think, is vastly underrated, and he's been underrated mostly because he hasn't been healthy. Jaden Daniels is a uh, multi-year starter at Arizona State, a quality passer, can make plays outside of the pocket with his feet. So you have two veteran quarterbacks, and you've already touched on those receivers. Kayshawn Booty, who could be, uh, if not the first, maybe the second behind JSN in terms of uh, wide receivers that are drafted next year, Jeray Jenkins. LSU always has skill position talent. They have a tremendous amount of talent on the defensive line. B.J. Ojolari, Mason Smith on the interior is ready to become a, a superstar on the national level. And Brian Kelly attracted a lot of talent on both sides of the ball through the transfer portal. So we're going to learn a ton about the Tigers in the, in the opener against Florida State. Uh, it's an ACC opponent. You have all of these new faces, uh, personnel, both player personnel and coaching personnel. If LSU wins that game, I I think they could be a sneaky good team that goes on and and possibly wins as many as eight games. I totally agree. And you remember last year in, in week number one, LSU was on the road in the Rose Bowl to square off against Chip Kelly and the Bruins. They lost that ball game by double digits. Coach O did not have... Max Johnson and that offense prepared. They were inconsistent, especially on the defensive side of the ball. UCLA was able to run the football early and often 
at will. That's the difference, I believe, in terms of the team last year to what we see this year in terms of Brian Kelly. From a defensive perspective, they're always prepared. He makes halftime adjustments, and I think that's where the LSU Tigers will benefit in terms of wins and losses in 2022. I like them over their six and a half. I'm even taking a shot at 40 to one to win the SEC West in year number one. Why not? I think when you look at another team that could eclipse their win total this year, Rich, Sam Pittman and KJ Jefferson to be to be pegged at five and a half wins. I'm not buying it. I know Traylon Burks moves on to the NFL, but when you look at what Sam Pittman has built in terms of the offense and defensive line play in terms of Fayetteville, they're going to be there yet again. They can run the football effectively, and K.J. Jefferson progressed as a, a quarterback in the pocket at the end of the year. I think they're definitely a seven- or an eight-win football team this year. Yeah, K.J. Jefferson will take on a larger responsibility to the offense. The one name before we go to a break I want to throw out that Arkansas did not have at full strength last year was Jalen Catalan out of the secondary. It's almost like adding a blue chip transfer because he was unable to, uh, to play up to his potential last year. He's one of the top safeties in the country, so bumper pool at the second level. Jalen Catalan at the back end and a well-coached team. I agree with you. I think Arkansas is overrated heading into the season. Catalan reminds me of former Texas A&M safety Armani Watts. He's a heat-seeking missile. When Rich and I return, we'll wrap it up. Keep it where it is. Coming right back. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Gam Lou, Cousin Sal, the Pro Football Doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. Pro Football Doc has found its new home right here with Sports Injury Central. And with that comes our expansion into other sports. Sports Injury Central will give you nonstop exclusive injury analysis from experienced team doctors from all three major sports. Doctors with resumes that include teams like the Chicago Bulls, the Texas Rangers, and the LA Chargers. So gain a fantasy DFS and betting edge right now for free at SICscore.com. The morning after. How do you evaluate an individual award race like a one for the most valuable player? Uh, that's a great question because actually I've done some more kind of work on this overall, whether it be Cy Young Awards or MVP mm. Awards. One thing I like to work in because I'm a guy that was holding a pretty large ticket on Sandy Alcantara to win the NL Cy Young. The only problem is I bet it last year at uh, wow. 100 bucks to win 20000 The Sports Grid Network. Maurice Allen, 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion. 2017, world number one. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? The Pat McAfee Show. The A.J. Brown deal was a massive one because you have a guy in his rookie deal, fourth year of the contract, getting that $25 million a year average extension, and now McLaurin jumps on that. If it was just Tyreek and Devontae, McLaurin 
couldn't have a case because those are veteran guys that have had more than a number of deals. But A.J. Brown really changed the game, and, and McLaurin's taken advantage of that one. The Sports Grid Network. Wrapping up today's show, two hours flies when Rich and I talk college football, but we left off talking about the situation in terms of the SEC West, talked about teams like Arkansas. Want to bring up that week one matchup quickly, Rich, in terms of LSU and Florida State. You have a coach in Mike Norvell that's on the hot seat right now. He needs to win that ball game week number one if he's going to keep his job. When you look at what he's been able to do in terms of Tallahassee has played down to the level of competition. They need to get over the hump and back to a bowl game. But I would still lean to the Tigers laying the three and a half in that week one matchup. Oh, I'm with you. Uh, I, I, listen, I, I think uh, – Jordan Travis, the Florida State quarterback, is going to have a good season for Mike Norvell. Mike Norvell knows how to work with quarterbacks, had success as far back as his uh, ASU assistant days, uh, Memphis. I think he'll do well with Jordan Travis. But the overall talent of LSU just uh, really overwhelms Florida State in this game. Uh, big year for Mike Norvell, as you mentioned. Uh, Deion Sanders is looming out there, whether it's just – rumor whether it's just narratives it's out there so Mike Norvell has to deliver this season and if he gets embarrassed in the opener by LSU man that could really just uh that could haunt him for the rest of the regular season think about this too they lost to Jacksonville State last year on the last play of the game that's why Florida State limped to an overall 5-7 and seven record last year. They get that victory, maybe they're bowl eligible, and Mike Norvell is off the hot seat. Let's take a look at the ACC odds entering this year. Obviously, Clemson, the front runners at minus 140, but you have a team in Dave Doerr and, and NC State that's looming rich overall. I mean, they could potentially make some noise in the ACC this year. A lot of talent for Dave Dorn. This is the this is the veteran team. If he's going to win the ACC, Joe, this will be the year. Yep, we'll see. We'll be here each and every Saturday talking college football for Rich Sermonello. I'm Joe Lisi. Have a great weekend, everyone. We'll see you next week.